also just want to take this opportunity to really honor and hear from our two Spotlight Award uh, honorees. Um, and so it's my pleasure to have uh, this discussion called Visioning a Political Home for Asian American Women Political Leaders. Um, this is a two-part plenary session because we will explore what a political home for Asian American women um, could be um, and what we could do. So part one of the plenary will be a chat with our Spotlight Awardees to hear ideas about um, a political home for Asian American women. And then part two will be a small group discussion about ideas and concepts. And this is where we hope as an organization to capture those ideas and input from all of you to help shape future women's collective programming. So let's please welcome um, our honorees, uh, Philadelphia City Council member Helen Gim and the Honorable Dr. Martha Wong with our moderator, Irene Bueno. to see you all. Well, good afternoon. Did you all have a good lunch? Thank yummy, you. yummy. Great. Well, um, I'm Irene Bueno, I, and I am so honored to be here today and to moderate this amazing panel of women who are pioneers, trailblazers, and just can't wait to learn more from them. Um, you know, as Madeline said, we're talking about um, I want to say American home, but no, a <laughs> political home. And I had to say, you know, I work in politics, I'm a lobbyist, I do fundraising, but I don't really know what this is. What is this political home? Because Probably because I'm not an elected official, um, but I think we're gonna learn today that, that it's really so important, and for the women in the audience or anyone in the audience who's thinking about running for uh, office or is in office, I think we're gonna learn something really important, um, uh, that this is a really important thing to do. But before I go on, I guess I should, first introduce our um, honorees, and I think some of you saw them at the dinner last night, um, but I will just give a very short summary because you all have their bios in the program and have heard from them last night, but okay. glasses first. Uh, first want to introduce Dr. Martha Wong, who is um, the um, chair of the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Dr. Wong is a native Houstonian and is a third generation Chinese American. Dr. Wong is the first Asian American elected to the Houston City Council and the first Asian American woman elected to the Texas House of Representatives. Earlier in her career, Dr. Wong was also the first Asian American to serve as school principal in the state of Texas and also to serve as associate superintendent of HISD, which I assume is Houston, the Independence School District. Um, I could go on with all the awards that Dr. Wong has won over her life, but um, the one that I noticed um, that was pretty recent of this year, in March 2020, um, KPRC Channel 2 Houston chose Dr. Wong as one of the 14 trailblazing women who, le who left a lasting mark on Houston and beyond. So help me welcome Dr. Wong. And next, we've already heard <laughs> from the Honorable uh, Helen Gim, the Philadelphia City Council member at large. Um, I remember when you ran, you were elected in 2016 um, in, uh, as a Philadelphia City Council member, and I have a special place in my heart for Philadelphia because my daughter now goes to school there and is a constituent. Um, but uh, Helen leads a human rights agenda which measures outcomes based on the health and well-being of young people in the city. Helen is a former public school teacher and journalist. She currently serves as a co-chair of the Local Progress, a network of progressive municipal leaders where she helped lead national efforts around sanctuary cities, the DREAM Act, and progressive public education policies. And I remember this too, um, it is one of her awards. She's a recipient of the a number of awards, including Philadelphia Inquirer Citizen of the Year and the 2017 National Rising Star Award from Emily's List, the nation's largest organization supporting women in elected office. So please give me a, give a big hand for our panelists today. Oh. All right, let's talk about this issue about a political home. I'm so interested in hearing from both of you about, and we talked about like, yeah, what is a political home? 
and we want why is it important and how do we create it? So let's kind of break that up first. Um, and I'm interested in hearing from both of you what you think a political home is. So Helen, you're looking at me. Let, let's start with you. Um, well, this is an issue that I feel very uh, passionate about. And I think especially for Apex, it's important for us to cultivate and develop. Um, being in political office or being in the political space is a purposeful place. And it is for women of color and especially for Asian American women, a place of loneliness. Okay, so many of us, Dr. Uh, Wong has been the first 30 years ago and everybody in this room at some point is still gonna be a first. And that kind of says, as someone said earlier, that's both great, Sheng, I think you said this, Council Member Tao, and kind of sad. Um, but. It's a reality, and I think because of that, uh, we have to be very, very conscious about political homes that we build. Uh, many of us are immigrants, come out of immigrant communities. We understand this in our bones. Um, home is what we build. Um, it's not just the land that you're on or where you're from. Home is where we build it. Family is who we choose. And um, the political home that we build is the one that grounds us in uh, the work that we have done that holds us accountable, as Bethany has said, uh, to the, the, you know, the challenges of coming into office um, when we are trying to uh, undo what has been unjust. So I will just say, if, you, if our being in elected office is not us changing faces with like little, you know, deletions on now, uh, now held by an Asian American woman. Absolutely not. Our role of being in office is the fact that our Asian American, our femininity, our gender, our experiences has to fundamentally change an unjust world in which the politics are not working. So if that has not happened, then we haven't really done much change. And this is just a little round robin, you know, pretty little circle of diversity. This is not what this room was created for. This room was created for women to come into office, to see transformative change happen, to build political power out of it. Um, that is, I think uh, Bethany said this earlier, you want authentic power. You want the kind of power that compels other people to come to you, not kind of the titled power or you know, some, some of the associated things. So I feel very strongly about building homes. Um, I come out of one, mine was a very small little Chinatown nonprofit where uh, you know, for 20 years we took on the biggest things that uh, could happen in the city of Philadelphia, whether it's like taking on you know, uh, stadiums and casinos on Chinatown land, whether it's fighting for affordable housing, making sure that our children are educated, um, making sure that we, you know, take on privatizers and those who would um, deport and detain our citizenry, um, how to build multiracial coalitions for justice, not how to just say no, but how to show a world that actually looks like the one that we constantly talk about. Um, a political home is a place where you do the work. You don't just talk about the work, you actually do the work. Um, you should be the grunt person. You're not you know, the princess or whomever, I don't want to gender this, but you know, you're not the special person in the room. You are actually the person who's making other people become better. You're tapping into people's ability to unlock their own potential, their own things, their own voice, their own ability to network better, to be a better deliver of the message. And um, the other important part uh, that comes out of our uh, folk art traditions at Asian Americans United is you're telling people how to tell a story um, because we don't have stories that we can tell. Stories of victory, stories of struggle, we definitely know those, but stories of victory, how did we overcome? And so in, at, at Asian Americans United, we do a practice where people have to retell their stories, but it's not the individuals who are there, or the ones who are at the mic at the time, who tell the stories because they can always talk. Um, it's important to pass down that storytelling ability to younger generations, to other people who are coming in new. When you're building out multiracial coalitions to be able to share so that other people are sharing stories of victories, of, um, of struggles that were tried, sometimes lost, but occasionally won, and that they were transformative in that moment, and that should give us the the ability to carry on. That to me is what a political home is. Um, and I'll say just one thing very briefly and then pass it on to Dr. Wong. Um, being in elected office is a very lonely uh, aspect. I think, you know, I tried to be not 
painful when I ask my question of Bethany and Vita and uh, uh, Judge um, and, and Judge Champon. But the you know the um, you know the the work is very lonely, and for a long time it took me a while to figure out um, how to how to find a political space. Um, I didn't come into office to be more marginalized than I was when I was outside of it. Um, I wanted to be clear that we had to win, we had to win big. But that didn't necessarily mean that my political family, which is definitely not the one you chose, which are your colleagues on there, had to be the only definers of who you were. So political homes were built through struggles that we did. We built a big political tables um, you know, that brought people in. Um, again, your being holding an elected office means very little unless you, what you're actually doing is kicking in the door and bringing as many people inside City Hall with you. Um, so you want to build out tables of conversation, tables of planning, tables of rapid response, tables of legislation, um, and you wanna mix them up all the time. So that was one way. And then lastly I'll say is that this particular session I was able to bring in with me two other women, um, incredible women of color, um, who are now like, you know, our little version of the Philly squad. And it is a transformative place for us. We share things, we go at, we make conscious time to be with one another, we spend time, we go out, outside of everything, we talk things through, we talk to each other about how we're thinking about votes, we share our, we share our speeches, because again, it's that storytelling. You want to teach other people how we're talking about issues, how we're thinking about things. Of course, we're supportive in all the ways that you should be supportive. You show up at different events and you rah rah on social media. But more than that, we're trying to learn what it means to form a bond in very difficult times, especially when we disagree, especially when we're uncertain, or especially when we're the only three no votes on our council body. So I hope that gives a little bit of an example. I'm happy to talk more. Yeah, thank you so much, Helen. Glenn, can you go to this one? Not this one? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me say that uh, in Texas, we call a political home your base. That is, the people that are going to support you. And what happened to me, uh, and being the first, uh, you have to build your base. You can't just go out there and say, you know, I'm going to run and not have any support. So what had happened to me is I had been a member of the, what we call Leadership Houston. I believe a lot of cities have a leadership program where you learn about the city and all aspects of that. And it just so happened that uh, one of the fellow persons in Leadership Houston with me uh, had decided to run for public office. And uh, of course then he asked all of those in the same class with him to support him. And uh, he lived in the same district in which I lived. And at that time, I was technically a professor at Baylor University, which is in the city of Waco. So I wasn't in the city of Houston to really give him big support. But I said, yes, I will support you. So what I did was I found, a, I, I got my church directory, and I found everyone who lived in his zip codes and wrote a personal card to them to tell them to vote for this particular person. And so that's how I got involved in politics was when my friend asked me to help, but I wasn't there to block walk, but I could send a note, and it was a personal note, to all of the people at my church to tell them to vote for him. Well, he won the election. After he won the election, uh, other people, uh, other Asians who were somewhat involved in the political process in the city of Houston were mainly uh, engineers and uh, Asian who, Asians who owned businesses. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to do business with the city of Houston. So it was hard for them to sometimes get a contract 
with the city of Houston. So they were involved in supporting other council members who were already elected and the mayor. And of course, at that time, uh, we had a, a white mayor and we had a couple of uh, Hispanics and we had a black on council, but no Asians. So what happened when my friend had won, the other Asians who had been involved in the city supporting other uh, council members uh, said, well, we need to work together because your, your candidate won and our candidates have not won. So that's how we got together. The first time around, we developed an organization called the Asian American Coalition. And what we started doing, it was made up of different ethnic groups. We came together at one of the fellow's uh, offices and we started meeting to say, let's decide who we're going to support so that they will support the Asian community. Well, after we did that, uh, we decided, well, why are we trying to support uh, the white fellows and the Hispanic fellows and the black fellows, and why aren't we supporting an Asian? And so we decided, well, rather than just support others, we're going to run our own council member. So the first person we wanted to run was an attorney, uh, a cousin of mine, and we got him a consultant. We got his hair cut so he looked good. Uh, we had a professional picture made of him, you know, a photograph so his uh, materials would look wonderful. And after we did all of that work, another Asian woman decided to run for the very same position. Well, he didn't want to run against another Asian, so he dropped out. So we didn't have, so the woman that was trying to run was not a part of the group that we were, we had formed. She did not win. So the next year, next two years, we decided we'd run him again. So we put him up, we got him all beautified again. <laughs> And you know, you do have to look good on your materials when you mail them out. And so we made sure that he looked good. And then uh, we had another young fellow who was an engineer who we thought could also win because he was in an area that was mainly uh, Afri uh, Asian American. He lived in that part of the city. So we decided we'd run two candidates because it was also open seats. So what happened then is that the fellow who was the engineer working for a large company, uh, his company would not support him running and he would not be able to take a leave of absence. So he dropped out. Then again, my friend and cousin who decided to run after getting him all ready, the woman decided to run again, the Asian <laughs> woman. So he dropped out. So here we are. The day before the last day to sign up to run for city council, both of them dropped out. We had planned a big, big press release where we were going to say the Asian American Coalition going to support two candidates for the Houston City Council. That went away when neither one of them decided to run. So we were sitting around the table and figuring out what are we going to do? And so they said, Martha, you have to run. <laughs> That's how I ended up running. So, so my base was basically that group of friends that we had put together. But when I decided to run and to try to find a consultant, the woman that I went to for a consultant told me, well, Martha, everybody's already been in this race for, for since January, this is like September, okay, that we were going to sign these men up to run. And this, uh, in my district, people had been running since January. And she said, there's already a, a leader that's going to win that race. I, I won't even take you on as a client unless you can raise $30,000 in one week. If you come back to me in a week and have $30,000, then I'll take you on as a campaign uh, person. So how do you raise $30,000 that quick? Went to my mom and dad. They <laughs> gave me 5000 Called my sister in Phoenix, Arizona. She gave me 5000 I have three kids. They all had bank accounts <laughs> that I had provided for them, okay? <laughs> called them up and said, 
uh, I'm going to take $5,000 out of your checking account. Uh, don't count on that money being there. So I got that $5,000, and then I called my sister in Monterey Park, California, and she sent me five, and I put in five, so we had more than enough money. I went to the consultant, and she took me on. She taught me very many things about running for public office, which a lot of consultants will not do for you. She taught me how to dress. I had to wear a suit. In those days, now this is way back in 1992, okay? In those days, we had to wear a suit to go door knocking. And, we ha and she told me, now Martha, don't wear heels, just wear flats, okay? So I decided to wear flats and I'd go knock on doors. But what happened was I was so tired after w walking on in flats, I decided I can't do this. I need to have uh, comfortable shoes on. So I started wearing tennis shoes to block walk, okay? So when I'm block walking with tennis shoes and dressed up in a suit, the TV cameras see me, and I hit the, hit the news. All three channels showed Martha Wong block walking in tennis shoes in a suit. So that was good publicity, uh, free publicity, and if you can get free publicity, it's good. So that was my base, and what I say to the base is you have to have your family behind you, you have to have your friends behind you, and then... All of the people that you know, your Christmas card list, I don't know if you have a Christmas card list nowadays, but that is your base, the people that are going to help you to win public office. That's your home. All right. Well, thank you. So what I got is that you need a foundation for the home. That's your family, your friends, and this, your network. And then in the home, Ellen, you have tables, right? And you have people, whether it's your, you know, Philly squad and and others, and in that home, you come up with ideas how to you know, break down doors and get things done. Is that the home? Do I, did I get it? <laughs> All right, we kind of alluded to this already, but you know, why is this so important to have these homes in order to be successful? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I, I don't think there's any question that, um, you know, the forces that oppose you in your election. So, you know, many of us, again, are the first of, will be the first of, some Some of us challenge incumbents, some of us come in under, you know, unbelievable circumstances, and others ride a wave of, like, um, you know, movement building that's, you know, sometimes uh, common in your area, or it's once in a lifetime. Um, but either way, the forces that opposed you or tried to stop you from getting in there exist once you take office. And in fact, they're more prevalent when once you hold office. This idea that your being there makes you special is one of the most flawed ideas of elected officials, like people who think that they have a magic wand, unless they're just happy to be there, which there are a lot of people, like let's be honest, who are just happy to be there in a moment. But for many of us, we come out of communities who are suffering in these times. We suffer when the economy goes bad and small businesses close up. We suffer when we have a detention and deportation machine that rips families apart, um, that you know has, I don't know, DHS riders on horseback, like beating Haitians, you know, crossing a, a border. I mean, what? So the, you know, public schools that don't get funded or that close down or in our city, like we had three children die in schools without school nurses because they didn't bother to staff them. Um, there are real consequences for what happens to our communities when things go wrong. So to me, being having a political home is about not just building political power for the sake of sucking it in and just like, you know, aggrandizing yourself. It is this idea that our, again, your presence should shake the firmaments of political structures. Your voice should resonate through things and some people should be upset. You know, things have to shift and change in this political environment. And so if you want to be able to do that, and understand that every time that that happens, 
a lot of stuff is raining down on you and surrounding you. There's an enormous amount of pressure, there's money, there's political establishments, there are structures, there's your own ambitions and things like doors close. So if you don't have a means to open up other doors, to, to play on other grounds, then you have shrunk your playing field. Um, so to me, political homes are strategic. They are responsible, but they're also places of joy. Like they should really, like I don't want it to sound like it's burdensome because they are really important. When you're in elected office, um, what was it? Like uh, I think that, you know, people want to say that, I, I can't remember the phrase, but something about like, you know, the, the people who are removed from communities are elected officials, okay? So like, as soon as you go into a city hall, a state legislature, or Congress, you're outside of community, right, at that point. You're no longer in with it. And that is okay, it's not like you are one and the same. I think it's a mistake to think, oh, I'm super tight, they all love me, nothing can go wrong, I'm perfect. You know, I'm reflecting the voice of the people. You don't, you have a voice, in a structure that has limited powers. Some of them are expansive and necessary at different points in time. But they are not a substitute for community. They will never, um, they will never replace community. And it is thus your responsibility to be, you have to exercise as much work to externalize your work as possible. So I say the, that for two things and just to wrap up, one, you're trying to win, you're trying to change things, so you need a political home to be able to help you think beyond your own like perspectives. And then two, you are not part of the community anymore in elected office, and you must grapple with that. You must be accountable to it, you must be responsible for it, and you must atone. <laughs> you know, and so that means you must push outward. Everything should externalize. So political homes pull you out of places of comfort, place of, of, of adulation, where people introduce you by your titles and a very long biography. Thank you very much, though. Um, but, but, you know, but they, they, you are here for a reason. And it does, you know, you may not be here for long. That's the other thing. You may not be here for long. And maybe if you do it right, you're not here for long. Because actually what you've done is just shift the things so that other things can come forward. Um, so that's partly why I think. And, and Dr. Wan, so just continue with your story. So you got elected. Why was that? Why is a political home more important? L let me say that the most important thing in politics is relationships. Relationships. If you don't learn to develop good relationships with everybody, everybody, <laughs> then you're going to be sunk. Okay, so once you have your political home, your base, you have to expand that base through relationships. You're going to meet a lot of new people. You're going to be meeting heads of uh, large corporations. You're going to meet very famous people, and you need to treat them with respect and also follow up and develop a relationship with them. That's going to be very important because when it comes time for you to be reelected, those new relationships that you have will help you to win. For instance, in my district at the state representative uh, area, I represented probably the wealthiest part of the city of Houston. Okay, when you represent a very wealthy part of the city, you represent many, many CEOs. I met many of the CEOs. I met the president of Centerpoint Energy, which is kind of like your Edison here in the state of Texas, and he happened to live in my district. So, developing that relationship with him, I also asked him to do a fundraiser for me. So you see how you can use the relationships when you build your home larger, those people can be of value to you. The other thing is that my political base in that, that man that was going to run but never got to run, he's a very, uh, he was an attorney. He had gone to law school and a roommate with one of the uh, 
persons with one of the largest law firms in the city of Houston, and uh, they had been roommates. But that little law firm would not support me. And you know, in the political world, there's always certain groups that are going to be involved in political campaigns. Well, this law firm would not support me. And so I called on my cousin and said, you know, can you, can you help me get into that law firm? And so what he did is he set up a lunch for me. And we met with the guy who was their uh, political director for the law firm. We had lunch, and of course, he told him how wonderful I was and what I was going to do and all this great stuff. He was a great uh, advocate for me. And I said, you know, your law firm isn't supporting me. Is there some way that you could talk to the people there at the law firm to help me? And he said, uh, Martha will take care of that. Well, we left the restaurant downtown. My political uh, campaign office was back in my district in Meyerland. And by the time I left the, dist uh, the downtown restaurant and got to my campaign office, a check was there from that law firm. So you see how relationships can help you to raise the money that you need to raise. So you'd be surprised what your base can do for you. Make sure that your base will help you and introduce you to the people who will also help you to raise money because you cannot run a campaign without money. My campaign, when I ran for state representative, the first campaign in the state of Texas for a state representative was a million dollars. A million dollars, and I did not have a million dollars. So it all came from friends and families. So that's gonna be very important to develop those relationships and expand your home. Thank you so much. I just got the sign for Q&A. So does anybody have any questions? Because I can keep going. I have a question. Maybe we can get things started. Yes, while go ahead. Everyone ponders everything. What have, what have parts of your um, political home that have sparked joy for you? I could not hear the question. Sorry, what parts of your political home have sparked joy for you? Oh, okay. I mean, all of them for me. You know, I mean, like the, the idea of being able to build a political space for yourself and for the people that you um, are closely tied to or your missions and purposes are tied is actually a very joyful space. I think it's that purposeful effort at making government, especially for me, since I'm on a local city council too, I mean, I love local politics in part because it's closest to communities. We have a chance when the state goes wrong or the federal government completely stagnates uh, or worse, um, to figure something out at the local level and to bring, a, tear away like the impossibilities that seem to come up whenever we talk about national politics to what must happen because it's about each other. Um, and I think that that just changes the space. We get tighter together. I think when we do it right, we can see something start from its very inception to winning it through legislation and then seeing it become like a bigger reality. Um, so I feel like all the places in which you invest are worthwhile, you know, and they are, they're really joyful because, you know, you're not in, you're not with, you're not in City Hall. Um, the, and the thing is, is that, um, I think that the other aspect of it is, is that if you do it really well, and all of us in this room, and especially Madeline, I think, and, and all the folks who are supportive here, we're fundamentally talent scouts, right? We're fundamentally looking for somebody who is inspiring us too. And if we're good at this, we're inspired by other people. It's not like we're like, dead inside, you know, where we don't, like, we don't have these emotions. All of us are in here in part because we're like, we could do a lot of things this weekend, but we are looking for inspiration. We're looking for other people, glimmers of, like, opportunity and possibility. And that's what be having a political home is. You're looking for those glimmers of opportunity and possibility, whether it's a young person who's walking through the door or a new idea that gets sparked or everybody, like, stops what they're doing and says, like, we've got to... We're, we're in line, it matters this much for us, and let's, let's charge. You know, so I think that that is one of the best places about it, and 
why I encourage everybody here, you don't have to have a title, you don't have to be in elected office, but you should constantly be creating that political home and space that brings other people in and unlocks their potential as much as it does yours. Well, I think the great thing about having a political home was, one, my mother and father were at the polls uh, at their precinct handing out my push cards. My mother was old at that time, and so she was sitting in a chair, but she was willing to go out to the uh, polling place and to push post, uh, uh, push cards for me. So when your base supports you to that degree, that's pretty great. Then when I ran for state representative, my grandson, who was just five years old at that time, block walked with his parents. Okay, and he learned how to, we also developed a staff that would uh, do our mail outs because using a mail house is very expensive. So my great friends, the thing that you probably, I haven't shared with you is I lost my husband. So I was a single mother with three children. The old, my oldest child when my husband passed was graduating from high school. So I had three kids I had to put through college and I had to finish my doctorate because I was under the timeline of seven years that you have to finish a doctorate. So I had to finish the doctorate, put three kids through college and, and then later on I ran for office. But when my grandson would block walk, all he had to say was, vote for grandma. <laughs> You know, so and he learned how to to put stamps on envelopes. So that's a that's a great joy when that happens. What I tell people and what I try to do now also is I always make sure that I have an Asian on staff and I have as many Asian interns as will come. And when I was in Austin, uh, the University of Texas had a lot of Asian students, and they all knew that they could come and work in my office any time they wanted to. So we would have five or six Asian interns working in the office, and that gets them into the political process. And when I was also at the city council, my chief of staff was an Asian woman who had helped run my campaign. So, and what I say to every elected official, when you are ready to leave that position, and we had term limits on city council, you pave the way for others. So I made sure after I ran for city council and I was ready to leave, that there was an Asian ready to run. So we have done that for 20 years we have had an Asian on the Houston City Council. This is the first time that we have never had an Asian on council, and it breaks my heart that we have not been able to move forward with that. But that's the joy, is to have your supporters help you and to see that other people are willing to follow behind you and that you have mentored them to help them move forward in the political process. We all have to work together to make sure that we're represented and have a voice at the table. And when you're in that position, you have all kinds of opportunities to give others opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you have a question? Oh, you can. Dr. Wong, I could hear you speak all day because I'm from Texas as well, so, um, okay, okay. So, um, just real quick, your time as an elected, how has that, like, in your political home, how has that helped inform your time with being um, the chair of the commission that you're serving in now? Uh, I serve now as the chair of the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. I was appointed to that position by the governor of the state of Texas. Before I actually became a council member, I also was doing some work for the uh, Texas Education Agency and traveling around and training principals on how to be a principal. And when I was at the airport one day, uh, a fellow who knew... Uh, Governor Bush quite well. We were talking and he says, Martha, would you like an appointment by the governor? I said, uh, yes, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> so Governor Bush appointed me to the Texas Economic Development Council. Well, when I went to interview for that position with the governor's uh, appointment officer, he says, Martha, this is a, this is a commission that's in trouble. Uh, they're having lots of trouble. They've misused the money. And uh, do you want to, will you serve on that commission? <laughs> and as I was sharing with my friends over here, uh, I am a very positive person. And I, I have a very uh, big uh, feeling of confidence. I've never been not confident. And I owe that to my mother and my father for giving me the confidence to do whatever I wanted to do. And so when the governor appointed me to that and the fellow was asking me, will you take on this terrible job? I says, of course, of course I will. <laughs> We're gonna turn that agency around. Well, we did turn it around, but we, we closed down the agency because it was so bad. And we put the responsibilities with other agencies. So you have to learn how to, and like I say, relationships. The man that I met in the airport, I knew him, did not know him well, but he knew of me and he offered me that opportunity. That's why I say opportunity knocks at your door. Take that opportunity, don't pass it by. So uh, that's, that's what I do. I'll share with you that this summer, I have been able to place three Asians in internships because they came to me, they asked me, and I have helped them. One of them is living with me, he's my sister's grandson, and he has an internship at the bioinformatics school at the University of Texas Health Center. So that's an internship, he's a IT person, and that's what that uh, school is about. I just recently had lunch with a young lady who was interested in politics, and I got her an internship with uh, one of the council members. And I, he's my favorite council member because he always does whatever I ask him to do, you know? I mean, when I have a trouble with the city, I call him and he takes care of it. And so you learn to develop those relationships. I say, if you don't know a council member now, or you don't know your council member, go take them to lunch. <laughs> go take them to lunch. If you don't know your state representative, go take them to lunch. You need to have that relationship. It's all about relationship. And I'm not an elected official now, but they respond to me and they are willing to help me. And I, I always say though, uh, you don't have to give them big money, but I always give them a little money, okay? <laughs> and that also helps to open the door. So I have a limit on how much I will give to people. So, and I'll also let you know, I have mentored two of the people who are now state representatives, Asian state representatives, a woman from Dallas and a young man from, uh, from Katy, Texas, which is basically Houston, Texas. So I'm proud that we've been able to open the door for other people, and that's what your base will allow you to do. Thank you. And do that I have time to ask for some closing? One more question. Oh, one more then, question, yes. then we could do the Okay, closing. great. Um, and this is probably more of a, a serious or a more um, seri a serious question. Um, you know, I, I love the stories that you shared about how you are able to kind of, um, you know, build your political home. How do you deal with disappointment or how, you, how do you deal with, I, I know in politics and when you're trying to rise and do things, I mean, how do you deal with a disappointment in people that you thought that should have been there for you but, but, but didn't follow through? And that's something that you deal with every day, I'm sure, in politics, right? And then, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is, what do you do when someone says no, but you need to get them to say yes? Well, the second one's easy, but um, I think the difference is what there's disappointment and then there's surprise disappointment. So I think if you're surprised by the disappointment, then something, you know, and you should probably ask yourself why you were surprised that you were disappointed. Um, in general, you know, like if you're going against the traditional structures or if you're laboring for voices that have not traditionally been part of the table, disappointment is not really like disappointment. It's sort of the political reality that kind of defines your world. And so a lot of that means that what we try to do is find the openings. I think that's one of the things that organizers 
do best, particularly those who are representing uh, lots of different communities who are often shut out of traditional political structures. Um, we're good at finding the openings. Where can you find some way to come in? And they make you be more clever, they're more creative. I think, as Dr. Wong said, they, requ they require good relationships. Um, and a lot of strategy and a bigger table. More people at the table, more ideas, more networks, more opportunities to open up. Um, and then I think uh, your second question is about when people say, people say no all the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> in politics you'd be very surprised like how few people say yes. Um, people say no all the time and it's your response, again, like if you're kind of the person, that's why, uh, you know, when, when I talk about building a political home, it's really important that, that you're the one that does all the work. You're not the one at the mic, you're behind the scenes, you're laboring, you're trying to pull other people forward, you're looking for things that the person at the front of the stage can't always see for themselves. Um, and I say that because, uh, you know, no is no's a reality. No to healthcare, no to immigrant rights, no to a livable wage, no to housing for all, you know, no to a decent public school. That is the story of what holds us back. So the idea is to find, um, to recouch these ideas in a much more common set of values. And the job is that individual who says no, that's fine. They have to be the only one who says no. Everybody else says yes, and then I don't care about that no as much. Because you're pushing, if we do this work right, saying no to these fundamental things that make life decent in America what it is, um, then you're the one who's outside the normal structures. And it, the way I tried to do that is to think about it in that way, that if you're really pushing for this big idea for transformational change, for things that communities have been crying out for for years and years, then the number of people who say no should be very small. And the number of people who are with you on your side should overwhelm the space. So my job is fill the space, overwhelm it, and um, the answer is gonna be yes. At the end of the day, people have to take a vote in public. And you know, I've had people say no to me uh, behind closed doors, but when I tell them, the votes, I'm not pulling back on this vote, we're gonna vote, and you know, you're gonna, the difference with me is I, you know, I can do it here in a small group, and I can do it out there in front of 600, 800 people, but can you? And so, um, so that's the difference between thinking that your playing field is one of 17, so for example, my city council body, or one of 42 if you're in the Nevada State Assembly, um, versus all the people who fill a space that you can do. That's your power to be able to fill spaces that had, a, you know, no is, no's a reality. No to healthcare, no to immigrant rights, no to a livable wage, no to housing for all, you know, no to a decent public school. That is the story of what holds us back. So the idea is to find, um, to recouch these ideas in a much more common set of values. And the job is that individual who says no, that's fine. They have to be the only one who says no. Everybody else says yes. And then I don't care about that no as much. Because you're pushing, if we do this work right, Saying no to these fundamental things that make life decent in America what it is, um, then you're the one who's outside the normal structures. And it, the way I tried to do that is to think about it in that way, that if you're really pushing for this big idea for transformational change, for things that communities have been crying out for for years and years, then the number of people who say no should be very small. And the number of people who are with you on your side should overwhelm the space. So my job is fill the space, overwhelm it, and um, the answer is gonna be yes. At the end of the day, people have to take a vote in public. And you know, I've had people say no to me uh, behind closed doors, but when I tell them the votes, I'm not pulling back on this vote, we're gonna vote, and you know, you're gonna, the difference with me is I, you know, I can do it here in a small group and I can do it out there in front of 600, 800 people, but can you? And so, um, so that's the difference between 
thinking that your playing field is one of 17. So for example, my city council body or one of 42 if you're in the Nevada State Assembly um, versus all the people who fill a space that you can do. That's your power to be able to fill spaces that had already worked very, very hard to have a street repaved in a certain part of my district. And the money was already allocated. We had already voted on it. Everyone passed it. But when this new mayor came in, he took the money from my project and put it in another project. So what I did is we have what we call pop-off. So every uh, time before city council, we get to pop off <laughs> and we can, we can say whatever we want to say, okay? So after the mayor took my money and every day after that, every time we met after that until I left uh, uh, the position, I would say, oh, mayor, when are you going to give me back my money to get my street fixed? in so-and-so area and you know it's just I'm just popping off so every time and this is like for nearly a year that I say the very same thing well I never got the money back but the person that followed me in the district council seat when he got there the first day on his job he said mayor when are you going to give the money back to district C <laughs> so you see, you may not win, but at least you also have to have a sense of humor to get things going. And so it did put pressure on the mayor, and that council member was finally able to get that street paved. So, you know, you have to push sometimes, and you have to push hard, and you're pushing against the person that can make the difference. But if you don't speak up, you're not going to ever get anything. So that's what I say to you. The second uh, disappointment that I had was when I was trying to carry a bill that would lower the property tax. And in the, city of, uh, in the state of Texas, they can raise your property tax as much as 10%. So I was trying to lower it to 5%. And I had the person who was the Harris County appraiser to help me write the bill to make sure it was a good bill and to make sure it was fair to everyone. So uh, there were a lot of people that were for the bill. And so when it came time for me to present the bill to the subcommittee, we had a, two busloads of people from Houston to come and talk for my bill, to speak for the bill. But the person in charge, the, the chairman of that committee, did not allow the people for the bill to talk until after all of the people who were against the bill to talk. And we didn't start the meeting till about two o'clock in the afternoon, but we didn't get to speak for the bill until about close to 10 o'clock. And my people were very, very mad and very, very upset. So upset that one of the people who were for my bill threw a shoe at the <laughs> chairman of the committee. And of course, he closed the committee and of course, my bill did not get out of committee, and I had to go and kiss you know what. And I went to his office the next morning, and he would not even see me, the chairman of that committee. So I had to persistently go to his office day after day to let him know that I was so sorry that what happened was not something that I expected to happen. And could you please forgive me for having people come who were so rude? And he never allowed my bill out of committee. So that was a disappointment. So you have to be careful when you have people come and speak on behalf of your bill that they're not going to do something irrational. Okay. <laughs> So that was a big disappointment to me. <laughs> but I just learned how to kiss tail. Oh and and I, I can do that very well. And you have to learn how to do that. And I learned to do that. Oh my God. Well, this has been, I think this is it, right? <laughs> this has been one of the best panels I have ever had to moderate. So thank you so much. Not only did we learn so much about political homes and just about your journeys and, and amazing stories. I think we all really much, very much appreciate everything. We, we did get a lot of seriousness in there amongst the um, 
the humor. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your stories and your willingness to mentor people and help people. And you know, I think that's something that we should all, what, whatever you do now, you can always help people and mentor people. So it doesn't start when you get elected, you know, start it now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.